rally. We're coming to you live from the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street. We are here and excited about today, so we are happy to see everyone this morning here at the Saturday Action Rally, and we are looking forward to all of our speakers this morning. We're so pleased to see you this morning. If it's Saturday and you hear the cry of no justice, no peace, you know this is where the action is. Our president and founder is the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. Chairman of our board is the Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, senior pastor at Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, New York. I'm attorney Michael Hardy and we'll be with you throughout the program this morning. We are so pleased this morning to have with us for our inspirational word segment, Minister Joy Pittman, the Associate Minister of the Freedom Church in Brooklyn, New York. Also, if it's Saturday, you know our musical director, the one and only Bavon Neal is here. Bavon was our original music director, and he's sitting in today for our musical director, Tyrone Richardson. Also, if it's Saturday, we know that our dear sister Darlene Crawford will be here to ask you what's on your mind. That's right. She wants to know what you're thinking about. There's so much going on around the world, around the state, around the city, in your own household, that there must be something that you're thinking about that's on your mind that you can share with Sister Crawford. And we want you to do that. We're looking forward to it. If you've not had a chance to let her know what's on your mind and you're not here, you can still do so. You can call 877-626-4651 or you can email what's on your mind at nationalactionnetwork.net. And of course, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house. So you want to call somebody. You want to tell them the action is on the air. The Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house and getting ready to come to you. Brothers and sisters, we always remind you that the NAN Youth Huddle will meet on Monday, March 25th, here at the House of Justice Auditorium. So we want you to spread the word and get into the action with our youngest and brightest dreamers of today and leaders of tomorrow. For more information on the youth huddle experience, you can call 877-626-4651 or email nanyouthhuddle at gmail.com. Today, Saturday, is at 5 p.m. Tomorrow, Sunday, at 5 p.m. You want to make sure that you are tuning in to MSNBC's Politics Nation with Al Sharpton. That's today, Saturday, 5 p.m. Tomorrow, Sunday, 5 p.m. You want to make sure that you are tuning in to MSNBC's Politics Nation. So with all of that, again, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton is in the house. But Dr. Alvin Ponder is going to come to you right now and give you some more information. He's the vice president of the New York City chapter, and let's give him a welcome. Thank you, Attorney Hardy. Good morning, brothers and sisters, listeners and viewers, and thank you for tuning in to another Saturday Action Rally with the National Action Network. Here's some information to keep you in the know. NAN Convention 2024. In just a few short weeks, National Action Network's annual convention kicks off in New York City when we will be celebrating 33 years of fighting for justice. It all goes down 
at the Sheridan New York Times Square Hotel in Midtown, where thousands from around the nation and even from overseas will gather from April 10th through 13th for NAN's yearly conference. It's guaranteed to be another historic convention. Members of the Biden administration, congressional, Senate representatives, city and state elected officials, and a host of artists, media personalities, clergy, activists, and many more will be in attendance. Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark, Robert F. Smith, MSNBC's Joe Scarborough, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, National Urban League's Mark Morial, Maya Wale, and New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy are just some of the featured speakers at this year's convention. Now, the annual Keepers of the Dream Awards Dinner, which is going to be on Wednesday, April 10th, will honor Whoopi Goldberg. My man, Jeffrey Wright. Did y'all see American Fiction? I did. Uh, Michelle Gadsden Williams, <laughs> global head of DEI at BlackRock, and Dr. Philip Ozua, president and CEO of Amana Fury Medicine. The Women's Empowerment Luncheon this year celebrates Stacey Abrams, M Micah Brzezinski, Alexis McGill Johnson of Planned Parenthood and other trailblazing women. Gwen Carr, the mother of Eric Gardner, Philonis Floyd and Terrence Floyd, the brothers of George Floyd, Sabrina Fulton, mother of Trayvon Martin, and Rodney Wells and Rovon Wells, the parents of Tyree Nichols, will all be featured on a panel about transforming grief to action. For social justice. Now, there'll be a Ferris fireside chat with MSNBC's Joe Scarborough on April 11th at 10.30 a.m., as well as a fireside chat and book signing with MSNBC's Joy Reid on that same day at 1.30 p.m. Again, that convention, the convention runs from April 10th through 13th. These are just a few of the highlights from what will be another impactful, inspiring, and legendary NAND convention. Get ready for four packed days, action-packed days of engaging panels, breakout sessions, plenaries, and plenty of networking and movement building as we renew our spirits and strategize for the year ahead. The details about the annual convention, including speakers and a breakdown of the program, will be updated on our website at www.nationalactionnetwork.net. And be sure to register now. Register on our website. It's free. And check back soon for more information, again, on the website for NAN's 2024 convention. We're excited. The fight for DEI. For the 12th week in a row, National Action Network and Reverend Sharpton have gathered in Midtown Manhattan outside the offices of hedge fund billionaire Bill Ackman to protest his vile smear campaign against former Harvard President Dr. Claudine Gay last year. He not only targeted Gay, but also went after diversity, equity, and inclusion programs which are now under attack all across the country. You've seen it in the news, in academia, business, and virtually everywhere. Every Thursday at noon, Nan and supporters convene outside of Ackman's Midtown office to chant in unison, when DEI is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, Stand up fight back, and what do we want? Justice, Justice. What do we, when do we want it? Now, now. Nan sustained weekly protests have garnered attention from a broad spectrum of individuals and groups who stand in solidarity with us as we fight to preserve DEI, whether it's higher education, Wall Street, media entities, or anywhere else. DEI is under attack everywhere, and NAN is committed to fighting to preserve it. Well, Cuisine, <laughs> helping Haiti. Reverend Shopton led a press conference with Mayor Eric Adams, 
several council members, Haitian faith and community leaders and others this week to deliver an urgent call for the U.S. to intervene in Haiti and to do more to help stem the unrest there. As the situation spirals out of control, they called on the federal government to do more immediately and stand with the Haitian community during this difficult time. Hundreds of thousands have been displaced, countless dead. Two out of three children are in need of urgent assistance. And the situation in Haiti is only worsening by the day. And Reverend Sharpton and others call on the U.S. government to investigate the flow of American guns, traffic it, traffic it, it to Haiti to aid the gangs there. Leaders at the press conference stressed the importance <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of working together and showing a united front to address the turmoil. Reverend Sharpton said that in addition to leading prayer services, they will travel to Washington, D.C. and push for resources and an investigation into gun trafficking or gun, gun traffickers. He also stated that once the situation on the ground is safe, they will organize a delegation to go to Haiti. Welcome to all of you who have tuned in and joined us also via live stream at www.nationalactionnetwork.net and also live on Facebook at The National Action Network. If this is your first time joining us, and or if you're not a member of NAN, we welcome you to NAN and invite you to join us and get into the action today. For more information and to join, you may visit again our website at www.nationalactionnetwork.net or just call us at 877-626-4651. Again, that number is 877-626-4651 or just text the word NAN, N-A-N, to 597-69. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ponda, for those announcements. Right now, brothers and sisters, our dear sister, Nancy, Nancy Darlene Crawford, is coming to you to ask you what's on your mind. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, National Action Network family. We are here with another weekend segment of What's on Your Mind, where you, the membership and community base, share with us your thoughts. We're going to say good morning to you, my brother. Give us your name and one thought of what's on your mind. Good morning. My name is Ernest Waters, and what's on my mind is DEI. There's a lot of us that march and don't know, so I broke it down. DEI, diversity, including of involving people of all social and ethnic background. Inclusions, well, equity, the quality of being fair and impartial. That means they have to be fair to all the people that they give the jobs to. Inclusion, bringing, including within a group or structure, and that's all of us, and that's why we fight. And I, I want all you all to remember that because that's important. So you will get out there and march. You should know what you're marching for and about. It's not just being in the march. It's knowing it. So when somebody comes up to us and asks us, we could tell them what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Good morning. Give us your name and share one thought of what's on your mind. Good day, everybody, and God bless everybody. My name is Sister Raven Word. I'm from Heaven, born in Harlem. I'm 72 years old and new, and I'm a National Action Network Lifetime member. Of course, what's on my mind is Bible scriptures. In particular, Christ Jesus supported all people to have human rights, but he emphasized that women have rights. Today, women who are citizens of the United States have to really behave like they're citizens of the United States, and that includes voting. Voting is a right that all women did not have at one time. Now that we have the right to vote, use your right to vote, women. Please, we need to have elected officials who support women's rights to choose whatever is necessary for them to live a peaceful, safe life. God bless you all and good day. All right. 
Okay, thank you so much for sharing. And those of you that are in line, please keep in mind, I ask you to share one thought, briefly one thought, so that everyone will have the opportunity to speak. Good morning, give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. My name is Kazembe, our Peace Nan family, our Hotep, but I have to say hi today. As a Pan-Africanist of Barbadian descent, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. H comes before I. Haiti before Israel. An allocation of resources, as has been said already and will be said again, but cannot be said enough. Haiti is a place that played a role in America's independence. At that time, Israel was a part of the Ottoman Empire. It did not exist. Haiti is not in the condition that it is because of the lack of Haitian strength. It's because of destabilization by the so-called core group. Uh, France, uh, Canada, uh, Brazil, and Chile. And so, although we need Haitian sovereignty and for the Haitian people themselves to make for a better quality of life, those of us outside of Haiti can play a role because, like I said, Haiti, Haiti did not get that way by itself. So in conclusion, I endorse and, con uh, and look forward to African-American leadership, political, business, etc., to be more engaged, especially in this presidential year regarding Haiti. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good morning. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. Good morning, National Action Network. My name is Dr. Jesse Fields. I'm a community doctor. I also work with the Committee for Independent Community Action, and what's on my mind is supporting the preservation and improvement of public housing. The committee is organizing against the privatization of public housing in New York City. Due to decades of segregation and discrimination by the Federal Housing Administration, most of the residents who live in public housing are people of color, black and Latino. Please stand with our people in the fight against displacement and the loss of their homes. They've endured the neglect and corruption of housing by NYCHA, by, by the New York City Public Housing Authority, and they've held on and raised their families for generations. Having now paid enough rent to rightly own their homes, they should not be displaced. This, the types of programs for privatization have been implemented in cities around the country. The same programs are being put in New York and being developed in New York. I put information about this fight of the Committee for Independent Community Action on the literature table, stand with our people who live in public housing. No justice, no peace, thank you. Great, thank you for that information. Good morning, give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. I'm Minister Sandra out of the Bronx in New York. It's not just one woman that need medical care. I look at the commercials and this woman is like, well, I had cancer. To the governor, please write that, sign that paper for us to all, as all women, to have care. Thank you. Good morning. Give us your name and briefly share one thought of what's on your mind. It's Jimmy J. Holloway. And I just wanted to share, you know, as a veteran, I had some flyers from there and distributed them up in the Bronx. I got the disabled vets coming, you know what I'm saying, to, for the vote. You know, this voting season is very important, so you gotta incorporate, teach the people to have more vote. So disabled veterans is coming here. I think next week they want me to bring flyers to hang them around in the Bronx, VA, Kingsbridge. You know what I'm saying? We gotta inform a lot of people, as many people we can inform to get them to vote because this vote in session is very important with Trump is what he's doing. Trump. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We have run out of time and I do apologize to those of you. You can get back in line next week and hopefully you can share what's on your mind. That concludes this weekend's segment of what's on your mind. We appreciate you tuning in. Back to you, Attorney Hardy. All right. Thank you so much, Sister Crawford, for this week's what's on your mind. Right now, brothers and sisters, Right now, brothers and sisters, Tisha Hunter, our Nan Change Choir soloist. A change.
he washed away all my sins and he made me Choir soloist Tisha Hunter, of course, accompanied by the Nan Band and under the direction of our musical director today, the one and only Bhavan Neal. Right now, brothers and sisters, as you know, it is Women's History Month, and during Women's History Month, we always have the Women's Auxiliary that presents special speakers throughout the month and uh, they will bring their presentation now. Verna Parker, the treasurer of the Women's Auxiliary, will introduce our guest speaker this morning. Let's welcome Sister Parker. Yeah. Yeah. Greetings and good morning. The women of Nan are in the house and on the move, connecting, supporting, and uplifting the movement and our causes, and activating women on the ground to be engaged, and involved in the change we wish to see. The Women's Auxiliary of National Action Network's New York City chapter organized to energize women in the city to show up, be involved, and have a voice. We support the chapter and leadership that work in ways that work to sustain the network and its grounds. We work to connect and empower the next generation for success. We do these things through various activities and initiatives that are boistered through the organization. We are preparing to honor community leaders 
at our 26th annual Women of Excellence Men of Vision Awards, which will be held right here at National Action Network, 106 West 145th Street in the Village of Harlem on March 30th, 2024, from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. For tickets, you can see our Women's Auxiliary President, Lisa Goldie Harps, or call 877-626-4651. Today, the Women's Auxiliary, under the leadership of our chairwoman, Kathy Jordan Sharpton, are wearing shades of pink which symbolize loving and kind gestures. Our guest speaker for today is Marsha R. Barner. Marsha is a recognized diversity, equity, and inclusion empowerment speaker, human rights activist, domestic violence advocate, community collaborator, senior human resources executive producer, host and a luminary for change and acceptance. Marsha garnered international acclaim after her appearance on ABC's network television program, What Would You Do? in an episode titled, Hairdresser Disapproves of Interracial Customer. The video of her appearance has received over 100 million views around the globe. It caught the attention of ABC News Nightline, which aired a clip of Marsha in a news segment about What Would You Do, hosted by veteran news correspondent John Quinones. Marsha speaks to audiences from her inspiring journey from the Brooklyn streets to the corporate streets. Marsha is founder of the Hugs Movement, helping us grow spiritually to advocate appreciation of humanity. Some of her many accusations are the 2021 Cranes Business Weekly LGBTQ, 2018 Black LGBTQ Power 100, and her most important award is the 2015 National Action Network Women's Auxiliary Women of Excellence Men of Vision Awards. Let's give a big man welcome to Marsha R. Bonner. Whoa, that's a lot. Have mercy, have mercy. Change. Good morning. My name is Marsha R. Bonner, and my pronouns, diversity, equity, inclusion in the house, is he, is she, her, and hers. And it is truly an honor to be a part of this wonderful Women's Month celebration. I would like to take this time to thank Reverend Al Sharpton, founder and president of the National Action Network, Dr. Kathy Jordan Sharpton, NAN's NYC chapter Women's Auxiliary Chairwoman, Lisa Goldie Harps, president of NAN's New York City's chapter Women's Auxiliary, <laughs> Verna Parker, assistant treasurer of NAN's New York City chapter Women's Auxiliary, Dominique Sharpton, the eldest daughter of Reverend Al and Kathy, who produces the live broadcast rally on WLIB 111190 AM, I was practicing that, and serves as the director of NAN's membership for over 45 chapters, and Ashley Sharpton, the youngest daughter of Reverend Al and Kathy, who is the founder and director of NAN's Youth Huddle, and the entire NAN family and each of you across the country who are listening and viewing for inviting me into your lives today. Yes, indeed, Nan fully understands that it takes a village to make a difference. Now, I'm not gonna take up too much of your time today because when you know what your purpose is in life, it's relatively easy to share succinctly and clearly with others. Because the message you carry and deliver is not yours to own. So when Verna reached out to me and asked, if I would be available to speak today, the first thing that came to my mind was, why me? There are so many women that could be standing before you and there are days when I don't feel like I'm worthy for the honors bestowed on me. This being one of them. What I'm referring to is a condition that infects the minds of people of color. It's called the imposter syndrome. And it limits us because we never ever feel like we are truly successful and that we are ever enough. But then that voice, oh, that sweet voice, whispered into my ear and said, why not you, Marsha? How many times I got to tell you the same thing? Always remember who you are who you are and how far you've come to be able to carry a message of hope 
and love that I have given you to share to others. Well, so here I am, folks. Here I am. And I believe that we got a little something to share with you today. Now, the month of March, we celebrate Women's History Month. And the litany of women I can name and honor goes back hundreds of years. So when I started writing out my thoughts, I attempted to list all of the women, I mean list all of the women that I could think of who had influenced my life in one way or another and who have made Women's History Month so special and meaningful for me. However, after getting through the first 50 names, it dawned on me, this ain't going to work. As the list alone would take up the entire NAN Saturday morning rally, which would not give Reverend Al time and space to share his always powerful and insightful message of hope and commitment to the cause, to the movement. And we can't have that. Hmm, I'm just saying. So after thoughtful reflection, I've offered to make our time together an engaging, meaningful, and shared experience. I trust you will indulge me as I move through this conversation. So how about this? I would like to ask for all of the folks here in this room and listening and watching, if you would take a moment to think about one woman, just one woman who has influenced your life. Come on now, this is for everyone. Think about it for one minute and hold on to that name. Okay. You got the name? Now, on the count of three, please say that name. Mama. Just say that name as loud and as proud as you can. Ready? Mama. On the count of three. One, two, three. Barbara Wellfish. Now, that's how we bring women of power and influence into the house of man and over the airways on a day like this. By filling our collective state wherever we are with women who personally matter in our lives. Women who have held us up during those challenging times. Women who have hugged us when a hug was most needed. Women who have encouraged us. Women who have inspired us. Women who have motivated us. Women who have shown us their own lives, through their own lives, that our lives matter too. The name you shared has done that for you. And because you said that name, out loud and proud, they are now a part of our lives too. That's how the energy of the God you honor works. Huh. If you don't know, now you know. So please allow me to continue. I just was told that I have another two minutes. One minute. They count, they count seconds on the sister. Just, I don't understand. All right, so I'm just going to go right here. There was a part that I had that I was include all of us, and it's about, I'm going to say a word. I'm just going to read one paragraph, and then I'll be dead. I'd like to um, take a moment to talk about something um, from the past, the present, and the future. Just going to take a caption from each one of the ones that I captured. When our people were captured, forced to crossing the mighty seas, and many died in the slaves and were thrown to the sea in death, we honored them by saying, Still we rise. Let's move to the present. When our rights as women are stripped away from us by laws that marginalized our existence and subliminally, subliminally designed to take our lives, we lift ourselves up by saying, still we rise. As the percentage, now we're going to go into the future. As the percentage of educated black women with bachelors, masters, and doctors continues to increase across the country, it proves that Still we rise. So, to close, and I'm going to play a little bit on this close here. My name is Marsha R. Bonner. I am who Verna said I am, but I happen to be so much more than that. I am a 
proud black lesbian woman married to a beautiful black queen. Her name is Sonora Bonner. And we have four children, a daughter, in-law, and a grandchild. And I am supported by my loving mother, sister, and family members. I am an African-American senior business executive leader who specializes in human resources, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. I am the founder of the Hugs Movement, helping us grow spiritually, an online advocacy community where I ask my family, friends, and followers across the world on all my social media sites to live and embrace a hugs mindset. Encourage, inspire, and uplift others through your words, your actions, and your deeds. And last but not least, because you never can tell a book by its cover, I am a blessed and grateful recovering addict with 35 years clean and serene. who endured a tormented and dark journey in the crips, grips of drugs and alcohol, living homeless on the streets for well over 20 years of my life. Yeah. Today, through grace and mercy, I stand in the loving embrace of the God that I honor and the women of NAN and the National Action Network's family of activists, advocates, and disruptors. Huh? You say, why me? Why not me? No one said the road would be easy, but still I rise. We still rise. Together. I appreciate your time and thank you for listening and rising with me today. Love and hugs always. Thank you. All right. And we thank you, Marsha Bonner, the Hugs Movement, our special Women's History Month segment. Brothers and sisters, right now, it is indeed a privilege to have with us coming up now. He's a historic activist. He's been involved in many of the struggles down through uh, our history and currently is the president of the Institute of the Black World, 21st Century. It's all about Haiti right now. We want to welcome Professor Dr. Ron Daniels. Thank you, Michael Hardy. Good morning, man. Haiti's on fire in the interest of time because we got to hear the Reverend Al. Haiti's on fire. Hello, Reverend Dennis Dillon. I'm going to give you a shout out. I am the founder of the Haiti Support Project. I also have a radio show on WBAI 99.5 FM 3 to, 3 to 4 on Mondays. We will have a complete segment on Haiti. Why? Because I have been doing work on Haiti since 1995. I've been to Haiti hundreds of, not hundreds, several times, many times. There is no more, I don't usually say this, four more expert on Haiti than Dr. Ron Daniels. And Haiti's on fire? That's the bad news. The good news is there is a movement that has the capacity to rescue Haiti and lead the path forward. To talk about that is a Haitian brother from the National Coalition for Haitian Rights, also with the Haitian American Foundation for Democracy. We are literally working on the resolution day by day, connected with Congressman Gregory Meeks. We are talking every day. This is serious business. This is all the way live and we are in the eye of the storm, and we're solving, solving it. Please welcome Jocelyn McCalla to give you a quick synopsis of what's going on and what we can do, particularly to support the Montana Accord movement. Welcome, Jocelyn McCalla. Thank you so much, Ron, for this introduction. I'm here on behalf of the Haitian American Foundation for Democracy, and I'm very pleased to be here with you this Saturday morning uh, in the middle of what I call a very serious situation. It's a very serious situation. I'm not going to dwell on the pictures that you have seen on CNN, on Fox TV, on ABC News, on CBS about the kind of catastrophe uh, that Haitians have, are witnessing today. 
What I want to tell you about is the fact that this catastrophe is not a Haitian-made catastrophe alone. This catastrophe is essentially an expression of the total collapse of U.S. policy in Haiti. It's a, an expression of a total collapse of U.S. policy towards Haiti. Now, Haiti, you know, as you probably know, suffered a major catastrophe back in 2010, the earthquake. You know, th th thousands of people died as a result of the earthquake. Economy was disrupted. The government you know, collapsed and so forth. Out of that earthquake came forth lots of promises of help, including from the United States. And from the United States alone, people gave huge amount of money you know, in order to sustain Haiti and to help rebuild Haiti. Unfortunately, the people who were in charge of U.S. policy at the time decided that the best way to help Haiti, as far as they're concerned, is to push Haiti towards elections, but elections without participation, elections that were not essentially democratic. And those elections yielded and led to the rise of a fellow by the name of Sweet Mickey. Sweet Mickey who proceeded when he got into office to siphon off the Haitian treasury about $3 billion worth of funds. $3 billion worth of funds. He created projects that never took shape. Nobody could account for them. And when people in Haiti began to demand accountability and say, let us tell us where the money went, they were met with repression. They were met with repression, both by police forces as well as paramilitary forces, commonly known today as the criminal gangs that have basically used a scorched earth tactic in order to make sure that the people stay down. But I'm not here to just tell you that people are scared to death about the situation and that a lot of people have, have voted with their feet by fleeing their re, the, the area where they live because gunfire uh, echoing all the time. But I'm here to tell you, you know, that despite it all, the Haitians have not given up, did not given up hope on building democracy in their country. <laughs> Which is why back in 2021, a huge number of people came together and said, let's try to figure it out all by ourselves. Let's try to build or come up with a Haitian solution. You know, so they went through a process, a process that included thousands of organizations throughout the country, many political parties, and they came up with what they call the Montana Accord. Let me tell you a little bit more about the Montana Accord. You know, it has, so 431 civil, society organizations signed up to the accord. 106 popular organizations, 86 political parties, and 326 individuals. This process basically said, this is the way that we are going to take back our country and make it ha happen. And they proposed a transition. They proposed a transition, and once they proposed a transition, unfortunately, the US failed to, uh, to understand it. This, the U.S. stuck to its failed policy. And this is why we're here today looking at a catastrophe in Haiti. Yes. You can do something about it. Reverend Al, as was announced earlier, held the press and said, we need to have a much more robust U.S. policy in, in Haiti at this point. Right. With you, putting pressure on the administration, we can do it. So thank you again you know, for having me, for giving me this opportunity to speak on behalf of the Haitians who are struggling to rise out of the chaos. Thank you. All right. I uh, want to thank Dr. Daniels and the Montana Accord Group for being here this morning to give us that update. Right now, brothers and sisters, we are so pleased to have with us for our inspirational words segment, 
Minister Joy Pittman, Associate Minister of the Freedom Church in the great borough of Brooklyn. Let's welcome her. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to give honor and adulation to Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton, President and Founder of the National Action Network, and Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, Chairman of the Board, to all speakers, moderators, and everyone in their respective places. I want to make the most efficient use of our time together. So let's quickly go to a familiar account found in Genesis chapter 3. We'll focus on verses 1 through 6, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, and God has God really said you should not eat from the tree of the garden the woman said to the serpent from the tree from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden God has said you should not eat from it or touch it or you will die the serpent said to the woman you surely will not die for God knows the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of the fruit she ate and she also gave it to her husband and he ate. I want to speak to you today from the subject, fake news. The story opens with a conversation between the serpent and Eve. The serpent is coming to Eve and asking her to question her, to go in her mind and think through what God has actually already given her as an instruction or given Adam as an instruction in chapter 2. The serpent starts with questioning God's instructions to her, and Eve responds, and not only does she misquote what God says, but she opens the door for the serpent to present her with false information or alternative facts, if you will. Eve not only eats, she serves it to her husband. Husband. The serpent's strategy was to sow doubt and confusion by twisting God's words. He manipulated her influence. Um, and oftentimes as women, we don't understand the power of our influence to change worlds. But he influenced, he used the influence of a woman to shift the entire world. He presented Eve with the suggestion that God's instructions were not only negotiable, but fundamentally misrepresentative of the potential benefits that disobedience to his word could offer. Even worse, the serpent deceived Eve into pursuing what God had already provided. The serpent claims Eve would be like God after eating the fruit, but in Genesis 1 and 26, we are told that God had already said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. She was already like God. On a spiritual level, this story is a reminder that our obedience to God is a non-negotiable and that our disobedience comes with major consequences. But on another level, one that I pray resonates in this room today, Genesis 3's narrative uplifts a pattern of deceit that questions and misrepresents truth, leading to misguided actions. Regrettably, the pattern did not end in the Garden of Eden. It extends into our present day where the integrity of information is often compromised, leading to a skewed perception of the lived reality of many of our people. In our contemporary landscape, the tactics employed by the proverbial serpent, diminishing truth, misrepresenting facts, sowing doubt, and exploiting perceived lacks are mirrored in the, the dissemination of alternative facts and fake news. These modern equivalents of Eve's deception aim to manipulate public opinion and obscure the realities faced by marginalized communities. And when they are successful, they don't just misinform, but they hinder the understanding and combat genuine efforts towards equity and justice. Yeah. Further, as the serpent suggested to Eve that she needed to take extra and self-harming steps to obtain what she already possessed, today's misleading narratives often distort the accomplishments and struggles of our communities, normalizing that our people should have to fight for opportunities and rights that should be inherently ours. As a result, demands for justice are erroneously pegged as demands for special treatment, and they are not. While Genesis 3 is a reminder of our vulnerability to falsehood, I am encouraged by Ephesians 4 and 14, which urges us not to be swayed by every wind of doctrine and cunning and deceitful scheme. Paul reminds us that maturity in our understanding and steadfastness in our commitment to truth is our defense against deception. We who have access to truth are called today to anchor ourselves and to be discerning not just in what we say, but in what we share. We who are rooted in and committed to faith, truth, justice are 
uniquely empowered to recognize and challenge the alternative facts and fake news that pervade the daily discussions most of us are deeply impacted by. And because to whom much is given, much is also required, we have the responsibility to stand firm in our pursuit of equity, to elevate the true narrative of marginalized and silenced voices. So Action Network, this is our call to action today, to cut through the noise with clarity as we come in to these political systems, as we navigate what is happening in our landscape, to uplift the silence with courage and to transform our communities into places where truth prevails, where justice is accessible to all, and where love overcomes division. Thank you. All right, we want to thank Minister Joy Pittman Associate Minister of the Freedom Church in the great borough of Brooklyn, the Change Choir. Change Choir under the direction of our sit-in musical director this morning, Bavon Neal. Brothers and sisters, get on your feet because we're about to bring to you the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. No justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, no justice. No peace. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. 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 
fist bump the person next to you, tell them you love. There was a prestigious women's group named Daughters of the American Revolution. And they would have annual concerts at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. 1939, the announced soloist concerto was a black woman named Marian Anderson. And they barred her from singing in Constitution Hall because of the laws of segregation. Later that year, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was first lady of the United States at the time, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt had her speak at the open concert uh, at the 4th of July there at Lincoln Memorial. Little did they know in 39 at Lincoln Memorial that in 63, they would have the march on Washington and Dr. King would talk about a dream right on the same steps. Little did they know that the dream would be picked up in our time. And this organization kept it going. The 40th anniversary we did with Mrs. King, the 50th anniversary we did with Martin III, and last year the 60th anniversary with Martin III. Why do we keep doing it? Because we believe that you can only make dreams come true if you put work behind it. From Marian Anderson to today, we never stopped and we never will. Cause somewhere in our DNA, we believe if you keep on moving, your change will come. I heard uh, Verna Parker this morning talk about how during Women's History Month we recognize outstanding women. And I thought about how when uh, I was a youngster at Washington Temple Church in Brooklyn, a lady came through Washington Temple that I'd never had heard of this before. I was like five, six years old, just a boy preaching the Junior Usher Board. And they introduced a woman named Althea Gibson. 
And uh, at that time, most because Washington Temple had so many uh, large seats, it was a large congregation, everybody from Jackie Robinson to Langston Hughes, in fact, my sister. and the congregation. And Althea Gibson won the Grand Slam in 1956. Wimbledon and the U.S. Nationals. And a lot of y'all talk about those that Serena and them now, but don't know that in the 50s, when we couldn't sit in the front of the bus, in the 50s, when we couldn't use a public toilet in parts of this country, in the 50s, when we were behind Jim Crow laws, Althea Gibson, it was a lot more stress on her than it was on Serena to take that racket and beat whites in contest. But she lived to see it go from Althea to Serena and Venus. If you keep on taking the racket and hitting that ball, your change will come. National Action Network Change Choir, give them a big hand. Give them a big hand. Certainly we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning for the Saturday Action Rally for you that are here in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the village of Harlem. And for you that are watching on various media platforms, and you that are listening on 1190 WLIBAM in New York, we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning to give our report on where the action is. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy. Give a hand to our musical director of the day, Brother Bravon Neal. Give Chris and our band some. Certainly didn't we enjoy Minister Joe, Joy Pittman of Freedom Church. I was listening, she went and got Eve in the snake. I said, where's she going with this? But she brought it home with a great message. And as we, uh, we got some Eves and some snakes up in here, Minister Pittman. So they needed to hear that message. If you were another two minutes, I might have come out here with my blessed all and, and choked a few snakes in the audience. Everybody looking around trying to figure out who I'm talking about. Let me congratulate the women's auxiliary every week has done their job. And certainly we enjoyed our uh, uh, Marsha Bonner, give her the hugs movement. We enjoyed her as well. Let me uh, say that first and foremost, I want to uh, uh, salute our minister, Ron Mc Stand up, Ron McHenry. He has now, we're going on the 13th week, marching every Thursday in front of the offices. Uh, 
And uh, he has done a good job, Bill Ackman, who has been the main proponent against uh, DEI. And I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. And we've said we're going to march on his office, right? on 11th Avenue and 54th Street, and it's the 13th week. I was there with them Thursday. I come out as, when I'm in town and do it until I have to go do my radio show. But uh, he is there every week. Brother Christian is there. And what gets me uh, is you have people old and young. And a lot of you young folk ought to be ashamed when I see older ones on canes marching around that circle. One, one lady, Sister Ivy was out there. Come on, give Sister Ivy a hand. Come on, Mother Ivy out there marching. Mother Ivy, one lady in a wheelchair was out there with us this past Thursday. And they said to me down at the carpet office, well, you know, it's cold. I said, well, just get me some gloves. I'm going out there and march with them. And we are gonna keep marching every Thursday. Let's welcome Impact Television watching us all over. Every Thursday from 12 to one, we go to uh, the offices of Bill Ackman. He is a major hedge fund man who has backed this whole thing of ending DEI. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. And many of you don't know, this is not something isolated to Harvard University. It started when they got rid of the black woman president of Harvard. But they, it really started when the Supreme Court overturned affirmative action. And when they overturned it, then uh, they, uh, they got together, went after a group of black women in Atlanta, the Fearless Fund, two black women who y'all have seen here and have seen on the picket line. And we went to Atlanta and marched for them. The idea of ending DEI not only deals with academia, it deals with contracts, it deals with promoting on, on incorporations, it deals with every aspect where companies, especially in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, started saying we need to have more diversity. They got shook up and I told y'all then and we were on the forefront of that movement. Not only, I, I did every eulogy for George Floyd and we did the 200,000 people march. But I told you a lot of groups out there talking won't be here a year from now. Why? Because I've been through this a long time. I can't tell you how many times we've seen tragedies and then people come out mad. Because them babies, they just want, I heard them on the, uh, what's on your mind, y'all need... No, because Zimbe, if y'all ain't got him on a program, he gets into what's on your mind and makes him a program. Say, <laughs> so y'all ain't let me speak, I'm going to say what's on my mind. Because Zimbe will tell you, we done met folk talking about, I ain't take it no more. Fired up. I ain't going to take it no more. That was 20 years ago. We ain't seen him since. They really should have said, I'm fired up and I ain't coming back no more. But out of that, they made all these commitments, and then when they overturned the Supreme Court, overturned affirmative action, they went after those programs. Why did they go after those programs? Because they never wanted to see contracts go to black-owned businesses, contracts go to black-owned media. They didn't want to see blacks more on the board, more promoted. And we can't sit here and allow them to turn back the clock. I don't care if nobody else does it, we gonna stand up and fight back. And that's why Ron and uh, Minister Ron McHenry, who heads our uh, coordinates here at House of Justice and Brother Christian, you know, I, I, I always uh, uh, laugh when people tell me, I talk to uh, Reverend Bird about it all the time, 
You say young people want to come into leadership, then come in and lead. Ain't nobody in your way. I remember when I was a teenager in Operation Breadbasket, one of the uh, chief lieutenants of Dr. King, Dr. King had been killed about two years before. His name was Reverend James Bevel. And Bevel would come and do my, I used to have on Wednesday nights youth day, youth night at uh, Bethany Baptist Church. I think sometimes about uh, when on Monday nights they do uh, the meetings here. And uh, I think about, I used to do them Wednesday nights at Bethany. And I said to Reverend Bevel, I said, I was about 14. Bevel said, Shopton, come here. I said, yes, sir. He says, you want to be a leader? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm going to teach you how to be a leader. You just stick around, I'm going to teach you. He said, I taught Jesse how to be a leader. I was Jesse's mentor and all that. So I'm all awestruck. Reverend James Bevel is going to teach me how to be a leader. And um, many of y'all saw the film Selma, and I think it was Common that played uh, James Bevel in the movie. I'm just trying to give y'all context of who said this. And week went by, Bevel ain't taught me nothing. <laughs> Two weeks went by, Bevel ain't brought it back up. And you know, I'm there every Wednesday night, anxious. Like y'all at the are anxious on Monday night. I mean, I'm... Reverend Bevel, field director, Dr. King, gonna tell me how to be a leader. <laughs> Finally, about the fourth week, he said, Shopton. I said, yes, sir. He said, remember I told you I'm gonna teach you how to be a leader? I said, yes, sir. He said, you want to know how to be a leader? I said, yes. He said, just get up and lead then. <laughs> and I said, huh? And that was it. If you want to lead, get up and lead and lead something that makes sense. And Dr. King used to say, if you're leading by yourself, you're just going for a walk. If ain't nobody behind you, you ain't leading nothing. Now, a lot of folk want to come in and be a star. They don't want to lead. They want to star. You set up the audience. You set up the media. You set up everything and put me up. That's not leading. That's starring. Leading means you come through the ranks and people have the confidence in you to follow you. And that's what they're doing and I respect and regard them. Give them a big hand. Also on, on this uh, Thursday, is the last Thursday of the month, is legal night here at the House of Justice. And you that have a legal issue, legal problem, uh, that's where you can come and get uh, in front of the lawyers. And uh, this is a brainchild of Attorney Michael Hardy. We do it now in several cities. Uh, but it started here at the House of Justice under Attorney Hardy. If you are in a legal situation, if you're in trouble, some of y'all in trouble or don't know it. <laughs> if you think you might be in trouble. Come on Thursday night at uh, 7 o'clock here to the House of Justice, and there'll be lawyers here. They don't charge any consultation fee or anything. Uh, Make sure you are part of legal night. I want to, before getting into, uh, let me remind people, before I get into a couple of things I want to really deal with this morning, our National Action Network Convention. April 10th through the 13th. And we open up on time, nine o'clock on that morning, Wednesday morning. Throughout the next four days, we have every kind of organizing workshop around economic empowerment. Robert Smith, arguably the most wealthy black uh, businessman in America today, billionaire, who did it last year is going to do our workshop this year on uh, corporate accountability and black wealth. Uh, we're going to have in our, uh, our legal, uh, I don't know the name that Hardy's given, but of our criminal justice, we have the DAs and the U.S. attorneys and some that are fighting. We have, many of us don't know, you have three black U.S. attorneys in the state of New York. Three. When I, when I was growing up, Southern District was where you worried about. 
Giuliani was the head of the U.S. Attorney's Southern District. There's a black man named Damian Williams. He'll be on the panel. Black man in Brooklyn, uh, Peace, uh, all of these. So we do. We got that. We got uh, everybody. Whoopi Goldberg will be there. Uh, in our uh, media panel, Rachel Nordling has put together uh, everyone from Errol Lewis uh, across the board. Uh, uh, Joe Scarborough, Morning Joe, will be with us this year. He and I are going to do a fireside chat. Joy Reid called me this week. She's coming, going to do a fireside chat and going to bring her book on Medgar and Merrily and going to do a, a book signing. Uh, Mika Brzezinski. Uh, is going to be with the women's panel. And, and uh, uh, the one and only Stacey Abrams is going to be speaking. But I don't want y'all to just come for the big names. I want y'all to come because they get into the workshops and we deal with back and forward. If you have not registered, guy stopped me the other day and said, I'm coming to your convention. I said, have you registered? He said, not yet. I said, well, let me tell you why I tell people to register. The convention is free. We don't charge nothing uh, to come to our convention. But when we get into rooms, ballrooms, or the big conference room, and it gets held to capacity, we go by the list. Otherwise, if you did not register, you will be on 7th Avenue waiting on us to tell you what happened. If you so busy or lecherous that you ain't got time to register, then don't get to the Sheridan and complain you couldn't get in to see so-and-so say so-and-so because you didn't register. We can only go by the list. Am I right? So y'all that are watching from around the country, we got an international uh, panel. Uh, uh, Sir Simon Woolley's coming in from England and bringing people from different parts of the diaspora that deal with our international affairs. Do you understand that there's more going on in the world in crisis than just Ukraine and the Middle East? I'm not minimizing that. I'm not minimizing that because we certainly weighed in on both and will continue to deal with the issue of what's going on in the Gaza and what's going on in Ukraine and what's going on that, uh, that even yesterday, the United States finally made a motion for a ceasefire and Russia and China voted it down in the Security Council. We're gonna deal with that at, at, the, uh, at the convention. But there's also thousands of us being displaced and killed in the Sudan That's right. and in Niger. And nobody's talking about that. We're going to make that a highlight in the convention. As I talk to President Biden, I not only talk about Israel and Gaza, I talk about the Sudan. I talk about Niger. We talk about Haiti. And let me tell you something. I tell our young folks that, that you don't get tricked. You get people that demand, arrogantly demand, that they, we support them. They'll disrupt you if you don't support them. But where are they on Haiti? I want all of y'all that was hollering and screaming about where we were. Where are you now that we're dealing with an issue of Haiti? If you don't show up for Haiti, don't show up in here asking me to do nothing but show you the door. Let me be real clear. When I was 10 years old, boy preacher, Bishop Washington, who was my pastor at the time, uh, brought us on a, uh, wanted to bring us on a Caribbean tour. And let me thank uh, uh, Brother McCallica, McCalla, Brother McCalla, stand up again, from uh, Haitian American Foundation. <laughs> that Dr. Daniels brought this morning. And I see a longtime friend, stand up Reverend Dr. Dennis Dillon is in the house. 
I don't know why Dylan ain't up here. You know, Hardy don't like preachers, you know. He just, he only like lawyers and all. Why you got you in the audience and every lawyer in the building is up here? Dylan is supposed to be up here, Hardy. I know, I know you, you know, all right. We'll talk about that in the after meeting. But uh, when I was 10 years old, Bishop Washington said that we're going to do five Caribbean islands. And he took me with him. It was the year my father left. And I, he took me trying to salvage me being brokenhearted that my father and mother broke up. And every island we went, Trinidad, Barbados, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, I had to preach. First time I ever preached was in, with an interpreter was in Haiti. We did a revival meeting in Port-au-Prince. So since I was 10, I was going to Haiti. I've been back many times since. And the reason why there seems to be this continual disruption of Haiti, in my mind, is that many in this hemisphere never got over the fact that Toussaint L'Overture and them refused to be enslaved and colonized by European powers. So this country would pop up people that would exploit Haiti. And my contention is you cannot be a real freedom fighter if you do not stand up in your hemisphere for the first black nation in this hemisphere that fought for freedom and empowerment and liberation. That is Haiti. Well, that ain't my homeland. It's the homeland of freedom fighters. It's the homeland of those that want to see empowerment. How you going to get empowerment in bed style and ain't no empowerment in Port-au-Prince? So that's why when I saw what was going on in Haiti, Reverend Sam Nichols came with Dr. Compass and met with us. 25 years ago, when there was a young Haitian young man standing on Flatbush Avenue outside of a club and the police grabbed him, took him to the local precinct and raped and sodomized him in the precinct. Took a broomstick and shoved it in his rectum in the basement of the precinct. I was there living in Brooklyn in that same precinct area. And his cousin called me. I ignored it because we get a lot of calls. And I and think people say things. Now I said to myself, as much as I'd fought Howard Beach and Vince Hurst and everything, I said, ain't nobody, ain't no cop that crazy in the precinct. I'll show you how this thing worked. I ignored it. The next morning, a reporter from Newsday who used to write against me called me and said, Reverend Al, I said, yeah. And I'm like, what scam are you going to try to come with now? His name was Mike McAleer. He said, did somebody call you about this kid that was raped and sodomized by cops in the uh, precinct? I said, yeah. He said, he's not lying. I said, what do you mean? He said he's at Coney Island Hospital and they did it. He said, you and I have been enemies, but this one is right. He said, and his wife would like to talk to you. He gave me the wife's number and I called and went to Coney Island Hospital. I didn't want to go to Coney Island Hospital because the last time I'd been there is when I was stabbed leading the march in Bensonhurst. And it was something to me just didn't feel right Anytime I would pass that hospital, remind me that guy tried to kill me. I mean, but a lot of y'all, a lot of y'all don't know how traumatized you could be. But a lot of things you need to deal with trauma. I never dealt with uh, the trauma of it, and sometimes now people walk up behind me and I jump because that's how the guy came up and stabbed me. Dr. Jesse Fields, stand up. She was standing there in the schoolyard that day.
Dr. Jesse Fields was part of them that rushed me to Coney Island Hospital. Uh, January 21st, 1991. But anyway, I called this woman, Abner Lewima's wife, and I went to Coney Island Hospital. And Abner Lewima was handcuffed to the bed. They had charged him with assaulting the cops that he raped, that they raped him. Handcuffed to the bed. And Giuliani was the mayor. Giuliani was on his way out there to tell Abner they would take care of everything. And to the credit of Abner Louima and the Nichols family, Bishop Nichols and Sam Nichols, Reverend Nichols and Dr. Compass, they refused to stop the movement and they let us march and fight with the Haitian community and we turned this town upside down and those police went to jail for what happened to Abner Louima. So when they came to see me on this week, they said, we need to do something, da, 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 we need to work, you can get to the president. I said, well, the first thing we need to do is, is Biden and them need to stop the gun trafficking. There are no gun manufacturing plants in Haiti. Where are these kids getting these guns from? They're coming down from Florida. And we need to have the federal government deal with the Coast Guard and all, rather than y'all out there trying to find Haitians, trying to get in the country, find the guns that are being trafficked out of the country. And we need to make sure the $40 million that was allocated for Kenya, Congressman Greg Meeks and I was talking about it this week, that is released. They're blocking it, the Republicans in the House are blocking the release of those funds. Kenya has said they would send a thousand military men to help stabilize, but they don't have the money. U.S. could just release the money. They find a way to release money for everything else, release that $40 million. And then some of us need to journey down. The mayor's in, uh, at the border now. I told him we need to go when it's safe in Haiti, but before it's safe, going to Florida. We need to stand with the nation community. You can't tell me that you have no way to stop gangs from being as dangerous as they appear to be. If it was not a black country, you wouldn't tolerate it. You'd find a way to deal with it, and we're going to find a way to make them deal with Haiti. It, it, you know, and, and they, they get us psychologically into this. If whites have disturbance, let's solve it. What's the problem? Blacks having violence against each other, gangs, well, you know, they're savages anyway, can't do nothing. Just let them kill off each other. With your ammunition, with your guns, these kids can't hardly afford to eat. So how can they afford rifles and bullets? There are people in the business of destabilizing us from Haiti to Sudan to Niger, all over the world. There was a front page story in yesterday's Wall Street Journal about Sudan. Because the major media is not talking about it. I talk about it every time I get on. I got a panel on it this evening, 5 o'clock, MSNBC, Politics Nation with Al Sharpton. We're going to talk about it tonight and tomorrow night. Right. You have got to deal with, you cannot allow them to whitewash what's going on in terms of international affairs. We act like we can't deal with foreign affairs. I remember when I was running for president 2004, McHenry, they said, well, you know, Reverend Al, this, this, this debate tonight, we did about 23 debates. They said, the debate tonight is on foreign affairs. It's not your sweet spot. I remember Jesse, I told him, what do you mean it ain't my sweet spot? I am a foreign affair. That's how we got here. Uh -huh. 
slavery was a foreign policy. The Atlantic Passage was a foreign policy. Every black in America is a result of foreign policy. Do you understand international trade? We are international trade. You bought us, didn't pay us. That's how we got here, got these names after y'all. Every time I call my last name, which was the name of my great grandfather, slave master, I am reminding you of a foreign policy that you instituted. So I want us to stand with the Haitian community because we're standing with ourselves. And we've got to stop this self-segregation of their Haitian, their Jamaican, their Trinidadian, I'm Alabaman. We all black and all been exploited, oppressed, and mistreated. If I came and kidnapped you and brought you to my house and made you and your family work for me for nothing, and when it was time for you to rest at night, I put you in the living room, your children in the bedroom, your wife or husband in the uh, second bedroom, you look like a fool coming out in two weeks talking about I'm a bedroom Negro. No, I'm a living room Negro. You all kidnap Negroes in my house. And that's what you're talking about. I don't get along with Jamaicans. I don't know about the Haitians. Like we all came over here on a cruise. We wasn't on no ocean liner cruising and got lost. We was kidnapped and forced into slavery, sold like a bar of soap, and had to fight our way back ever since. And the fight is not with each other. The fight is the systems that want to keep us all down. A lot of this anti-immigration movement is fueled by racism. When you hear Trump calling Haiti and African nations as whole countries, and he's talking about building a wall because he's talking about Mexicans and Ecuadorians and people from Venezuela. He ain't talking about no wall on the Canadian border. Hello. And he's not anti-immigration. Two of his wives were immigrants. His mama-in-law was an immigrant. Four of his children are the babies of immigrants. He is using this to try and inflame a racial uh, stereotype. Because he's playing to a crowd that feel that they are running low on the population and it's us against them. And they got some of you out there joining your own demise. Well, you know, I, I don't know what Biden is doing. Well, wake up and look at it. I mean, can you... you I was telling the guy the other day, he said, well, are we better off four years later? Four years ago, we was all inside, hiding under the bed from COVID. Had masks on. Couldn't go to work. Couldn't go to church. Couldn't do nothing four years ago. Because the president of the United States at that time told us it'll be over in two weeks. Don't worry about it. Dr. Fauci 
told us, no, this is serious and it can get worse. He said, don't listen to Fauci. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Then when it started escalating, he said, well, take some bleach. <laughs> you was better off four years ago? <laughs> Have you forgot unemployment went in the double digits? Now it's below 3% and for blacks 5%. Lowest black unemployment in 50 years. Black wealth gap narrowed. I ain't talking about vote for Biden. I'm talking about vote for yourself. And when they see me coming, they know I'm going to stand up for something. Because I don't care how much we get. It ain't enough. <laughs> President Obama used to say, and, and Biden say now, when Al come, he wants something else. That's right. <laughs> and you know why? Because every time I walk up the steps and go in that White House, I think about how my forefathers built that White House and never got paid. <laughs> and some blacks go in there, Honored to be in a house. I'm not honored to be in a house that you never paid for the people that served it. I come to work and represent those that you never paid. Right. Yes, sir. It is our contention yes, sir. that we must and we shall stand with all of our people everywhere. And that, that, that's why at our convention, when we come out, we come out with an action agenda. And one of the action agendas must be around Haiti. Just like we rallied Dennis Dillon around Abner, we need to start some rallies. We need to put people in the street around the UN. We need to put people in the street around the US mission. We need to put the pressure on. And all of you all that talking about y'all getting ready for the Easter holiday, we need to resurrect a movement around our issues from DEI to Haiti. A lot of us, I, I, I look at what's going on now, a lot of us have just forgotten how to fight. And we've reduced now movements to documentaries. Y'all sit up and watch documentaries. Talk about, oh, that's back in the day. Rather than understanding that is your history and the tactics that got you where you are. They called me the other day, you, you as a teenager, you worked with Shirley Chisholm. Yes, yeah, I was a youth director of a 72 campaign for president. A lot of folk don't know the history. In 68, Shirley Chisholm ran for, for Congress in Brooklyn. She was an assemblywoman. I was 13, gonna be 14 that October. Bishop Washington, as many of the ministers in that day, Bishop Washington was my pastor, was a Republican, Stephen Marshall. And the Republicans was running for president, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon ran a Republican in bed style, who had been an a epic civil rights leader, head of core, James Farmer. James Farmer was one of the big six in 63. He didn't make the march because he was in jail in Louisiana. He was an authentic freedom fighter. But he had made a deal with the Republicans and ran as the Republican candidate for Congress against this woman, Shirley Chisholm. They got me and said, now, Al, now again, now I'm 13. Al, your job is to be on the corners with Farmer and use the megaphone, just like Ron be out there in front of uh, Aker's office with the megaphone 
and I'm yelling farmer for Congress and I'm whipping up a crowd so he could speak. After about the third or fourth rally, Shirley Chisholm and them would be on the other side. Shirley Chisholm looked at me and says, young man, you're on the wrong side. And she started talking to me, and in about three weeks, first time me and Bishop Walsh had a disagreement, I switched over and was yelling for Shirley. <laughs> and we were close from then on, when she ran for president, went on. When I look at Shirley's story that they put on one of these streams, I think about from Shirley Chisholm to Kamala Harris, it's been one straight line. None of this happened by accident. If Shirley had not broke through the psyche that whites felt that black women couldn't do nothing but cook their food and mop the floor, Shirley broke through that. <laughs> Mary McLeod Bethune broke through that. And that's why Kamala could be digested. That's why Katanji, Brown Jackson could sit up on the Supreme Court. You get to these places and forget what got you there. It was a struggle. It was a fight. It was people that never enjoyed the results of what they did, but they made sure that you did. So the least you could be is not be ungrateful. Three or four weeks ago, when we were marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, and I'm locked arms with Kamala Harris, and we were walk, people want to know what he's talking about. I was talking about Shirley. And she was eating it up because she understands at the level she's at now. They got to run around dealing with world affairs. She's the vice president of the United States. And she knows she didn't get there by herself. That's why some of y'all saw the other week when uh, the Griot gave me the Griot Award and all these big entertainers out there. Everybody from Eddie Murphy to Kevin Hart, everybody you can think of. And I told them, y'all are sitting up here like your talent got you to Hollywood. You ain't the first talented Negroes in America. There were folks that had talent before you, but they were not allowed to display their talent. And it was some untalented, ungifted blacks that laid down in the gutter and went to jail. Some went to their grave that opened up these stages for you that open up Hollywood for you. Don't sit here with Negro amnesia. Sometimes we have to remind them how they got where they are. Even in the Bible, soon as the children of Israel got out of bondage, got across the Red Sea, they forgot the struggle. That's how they got lost in the wilderness. It wasn't that long, it didn't take 40 years to go from the promised land to the promised land from the wilderness, but they got lost. And that's what's happened today, is Negroes has gotten lost. You forgot who you are. You forgot the struggle. You forgot the dignity and pride that we started putting in our people in the 70s and 80s. We forgot that. You done went from black excellence to rapping about you ain't nothing but a nigga. In public. Calling your mama a hoe and a bee. You lost in the wilderness. You forgot how you got there, standing on stages that they never let us stand on, calling yourself a nigger. Something's wrong with you. And if nobody won't call you out, I'll call you out because somebody need to bring you back so we can finish this journey. Time for the elders of our community 
to call us to order. Ain't no order in our community. You can't have court without the judge saying, I call it for order in the court. You got this whole thing of, well, we don't need to hear the old school and the elders and we gonna have the young Turks that don't know nothing do all of what we need some order. In Africa, they go to the elders of the village. And the soldiers and the giants would come out of that. That's why when Nelson Mandela died, who led Kazembe to the first democratic election in South Africa and became the president of South Africa, being the Nobel Prize winner, was heralded all over the world. But when he died, his daughter was here a few weeks ago. He said, no, don't bury me in the state capital, in the nation's capital. Madiba, you, 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 you were the first president of South Africa. No, bring me and bury me out in the village. Yeah. Bury me with the elders. Because he understood that the fight, the gallantry that made him what he was didn't come from the capital. Yes, it came sir. from the village. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And the reason why some of y'all don't last is you forgot what birthed you in the first place. That's why I don't care how many TV shows I get, how many radio shows I get. I'm here every Saturday morning because I understand where I'm rooted is where you're going to grow from. And let me tell you this, I meant to go through this, but y'all had a good sermon anyway. You didn't need me to have to do it. Reverend Sister Pittman did. But tomorrow, I want y'all to miss what, don't miss one thing. Tomorrow they call it Palm Sunday. I don't know what Bird going to preach. I don't know what Pittman going to do. But one thing they miss about Palm Sunday, it's two points and I'll let you go. They said that Jesus had become popular where everywhere was hearing about this man that was healing the sick and doing miracles. Let me tell you something. There's nothing more dangerous, Brother Christian, than when you get popular. Yes, sir. Some of us can't handle adversity, but then others of us can't handle popularity. I was tested when it came down on me. Come after me, gonna put me in jail, gonna soup up charges. That was a test. But it was also a test years later when they started praising me. The new Al Sharpton. I could have went for that. It wasn't nothing new. I was the same Al Sharpton. I just lost a lot of weight. But it wasn't nothing new. And Jesus, as he was coming into Jerusalem, they were souping him up, McHenry. They, they, the mass is gonna be there. The throngs are going to be there. Jesus said, go down. He said, you will see this calf that is tied, this cult. That's it. Yes, sir. Tied up. Uh -huh. Loose him. Loose and if anybody asks you where you're going with that cult, tell them the Lord the yes. has need of him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. First thing you got to know about Palm Sunday is you can't do what you were born to do. You cannot do what you were destined to do, you can't be who you were born to be till you get loose from what you tied up to. You got dreams, but you tied up. You got wishes, but you tied up. You want to be something, but you tied up. The first key of Palm Sunday is to get loose. Untie yourself from your friends. Untie yourself from your habits. Untie yourself from your wicked ways. Lose him. The Lord has use for you. God can't use you till you get loose. Second thing is when you get loose and start riding through the city. They're going to lay palms at you. They're going to praise you. They're going to say Hosanna. 
My last point is don't get fooled by the palms. Because the same folk giving you palms are going to be saying crucify you by the end of the week. Reason why you get your heart broken, you've been fooled by the palms. Reason you get all upset and disappointed, you've been fooled by the palms. But I understand every Palm Sunday is followed by a good Friday. Those that's on my side will be on the other side by the end of the week. But I don't worry about it. I used to get mad, Reverend Stephen Marshall, when some of my palm layers turn on me. I used to get hurt when those that were cheering me would turn and jeer on me. But I learned that behind every Good Friday, there's an Easter Sunday. You can crucify me. You can nail me. You can mock me. You can put thorns on my head. And you can even bury me. I can't stop the crucifixion. But you can't stop the resurrection. There is a God that promised me if you be faithful, over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. So I'm ready for the resurrection. I'm ready for us to get up. I'm ready for us to rise again. Stand up black man. Stand up black woman. This is our time. This is our day. It's time for the resurrection. That's why I like that song, Because He Lives. I can face tomorrow. Because He Lives. Because He got up that Sunday morning. All fear is gone. Because He Lives. I ain't depending on the strength of myself. My strength will run out. But He Lives. He Lives. I seen a black woman. Bring the billionaire in the court and strip him down in front of the world. Yeah. Donald Trump, who called on five boys from this neighborhood to be executed. Now he's running around hustling, trying to get up money because a black woman stood up because he lives.
Everybody singing. Everybody singing. Everybody singing. Everybody singing. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. Everybody sing it. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. I'm going to open the doors of the church. Do you have church in here today? I said church. I'm going to open the doors of the movement. There may be someone here today that never became a member of the National Action Network. If you're here and never joined, now's your chance. Come down to me. We'll sign you up right now and become a member of the National Action Network. You that are listening on radio, you can go to www.nationalactionnetwork.net and you can join online right now. Come on. Everybody singing. Come on. Everybody sing. Everybody singing. Everybody sing it, sing it like you mean it, sing it like you mean it. One last time, y'all. One last time, y'all. One last time, y'all. All right, all right. We're going to move quickly. I promise I'll let you out. I say by 11 on radio, we're going to be about by 11 2, 11 02, 11 03. I'm going to raise our offering, take in our new member, and then we're going to shake hands. And uh, I think they haven't committed meetings. What? Volunteers for the convention is meeting this afternoon, uh, right after the broadcast. So we want everybody to act accordingly. You in Radio Land again? You can go to www.national actionnetwork.net and register for the convention you can join on there you can give in the offering on there don't feel left out because you was ducking the rain a lot of us here today in the rain but uh, you that didn't you can write on our website nationalactionnetwork.net you can give right now People talk to me all the time. Reverend Al, I got to figure out how to support you. It ain't hard to figure out. Go to nationalactionnetwork.net and hit where it says contributions. And you can give right there. That's how you can help us out. Same way you go shopping online. They got it now where you can lay up in the house and order the food, they bring it to you. So you know how to go online for what you want. Go online and support what you need. All right, let's come forward. Don't forget, go and register for National Action Network. All right, we still a minute on there. Let, let me say this also, as, uh, as you register, we will be sending out this week the uh, schedule uh, so everyone will know which workshop is what time and you can say what you want to attend. 
It's four days. You may not be able to do all four. You want to do one day, two day, three day, you can register that way. Many of our chapters as of last Thursday, when I do chapter calls on Thursday and national staff, we got officers in six cities. And uh, we've got several hundred just coming from out of town. Uh, they got a half a plane load coming from L.A. alone. And they did it last year. Uh, people say, why they get so many people at NAN's convention? Because we are an organization. We not having a fit. We do this every day. We have rallies here 52 weeks a year. Every Saturday. So I ain't got to get up a crowd. We always got a crowd. We have our march on Washington. The reason we have thousands is we organize. Our chapters stay organized. I'm on radio every day on not only Sirius, but in 42 cities that Kathy Hughes gave us, and I'm on TV. So, but the point of that is if you got a megaphone and not using it, then you wasn't about nothing in the first place. Hello. So we need to be able to do what we are committed to do. All right, I need everybody to give to the best of your ability. The best of your ability. I need about 10 people that can start me with $100 each. I need about 10 people. Guardians, $100. Minister Gil, Gilchrist, $100.